Hi, everybody. I'm Bernard Schwartz. I'm the director of the 92nd Street Wise Unterberg Poetry Center. Welcome to our uh, kickoff event of the spring virtual season uh, conversation between Viet Thanh Nguyen and R.O. Kwan. Um, really happy to uh, have you all joining us tonight. The format is pretty straightforward. Uh, Viet and Reese will uh, talk for about 45 minutes. And then uh, if we get some good audience questions, we'll uh, come back and ask some of those. Uh, if we don't, then they'll just keep talking until the hour is uh, over. Um, before I hand the stage to them, I did just want to plug some of the other uh, spring events. Next Thursday, uh, Kazuo Ishiguro will be in conversation with Ruman Alam. Uh, that event will start at 6 p.m. Uh, and then throughout the spring and early summer, we've got appearances by Jhumpa Lahiri and Edward St. Aubin and Cynthia Ozick, Yusuf Komenyaka. And uh, I hope you'll uh, come back. Uh, and that's it for me. Uh, I hope you enjoy the show. Please welcome Viet Thanh Nguyen and R.O. Kwan. some good questions if they want to have those shared. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Aro Kwan. I'm the author of The Incendiaries and co-editor of the anthology Kink. Um, thank you, Bernard. Thank you, 92nd, 92Y. Um, I was remembering that the first 92Y event I attended was with Toni Morrison and Jeanette Winterson. And it was like the skies opened up and I could see paradise. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm talking about the, their first edition, Toni Morrison's Beloved. So. Oh, Just oh my one. gosh. Yes, 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 yes. I was like, where is he pointing? Okay, got it. <laughs> um, it's a joy to be here. Thank you everyone in the audience for spending your Thursday with us. Please send in your questions and we'll, um, we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the event. Um, so Viet Tan Nguyen, um, who I am very honored to be here with, um, is the author of The Committed, which continues the story of the sympathizer awarded the 2016 Pulitzer Prize in fiction alongside seven other prizes. He is also the author of the short story collection, The Refugees, the nonfiction book, Nothing Ever Dies, a finalist for the National Book Award, and is the editor of an anthology of refugee writing, The Displaced. Um, and I'm gonna encourage you to, there isn't a buy link, but I'm gonna encourage you to buy the book and to buy it from your local independent bookstores. Um, bookstores are really, really struggling during this pandemic and they can really use the support. Um, remember, it might take a minute, there's a pandemic, post offices have been delayed. Um, just, just have a little patience and the book will show up. Um, Okay, first we're going to, before the discussion, Viet is going to read a little bit from the committed. Well, great. Well, thanks so much for, for being here with me, Reese. You know, it's a real pleasure. I love the incendiaries. I've blurred the book. And I, just, I think I've seen you more times online than in real life. We've actually seen each other quite a bit here during the, uh, the pandemic. But let me get to the reading. And, uh, you know, for the audience, the committed picks up exactly where the sympathizer left off. You don't have to have read the sympathizer, although I hope you have. <laughs> I think it's a good book. But, you know, it, 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 The Sympathizer ends with our sympathizer still alive and on a refugee uh, ship or boat leaving Vietnam. And that's exactly where the committed starts. So here we go. We, the unwanted, wanted so much. We wanted food, water, and parasols, although umbrellas would be fine. We wanted clean clothes, baths, and toilets even of the squatting kind, since squatting on land was safer and less embarrassing than clinging to the bulwark of a rolling boat with one's posterior hanging over the edge. We wanted rain, clouds, and dolphins. We wanted it to be cooler during the hot day and warmer during the freezing night. We wanted an estimated time of arrival. We wanted not to be dead on arrival. We wanted to be rescued from being barbecued by the unrelenting sun. We wanted television, movies, music, anything with which to pass the time. We wanted love, peace, and justice, except for our enemies, whom we wanted to burn in hell, preferably for eternity. We wanted independence and freedom, except for the communists, who should all be sent to re-education, preferably for life. We wanted benevolent leaders who represented the people, by which we meant us, and not them, whoever they were. 
We wanted to live in a society of equality. Although if we had to settle for owning more than our neighbor, that would be fine. We wanted a revolution that would overturn the revolution we had just lived through. In sum, we wanted to want for nothing. What we most certainly did not want was a storm, and yet that was what we got on the seventh day. The faithful once more cried out, God, help us. The non-faithful cried out, God, you bastard. Faithful or unfaithful, there was no way to avoid the storm, dominating the horizon and surging closer and closer. Whipped into a frenzy, the wind gained momentum, and as the waves grew, our arc gained speed and altitude. Lightning illuminated the dark furrows of the storm clouds, and thunder overwhelmed our collective groan. A torrent of rain exploded on us, and as the waves propelled our vessel ever higher, the faithful prayed and the unfaithful cursed, but both wept. Then our ark reached its peak, and, for an eternal moment, perched on the snow-capped crest of a watery precipice. Looking down on that deep, wine-colored valley awaiting us, we were certain of two things. The first was that we were absolutely going to die. And the second was that we would almost certainly live. Yes, we were sure of it. We will live. And then we plunged, howling, into the abyss. So he eventually makes it to Paris of 1982, and he's been deeply traumatized by the events of the sympathizer, which means he's prone to making some very bad decisions. And the worst decision that he probably makes in coming to Paris is what he's going to talk about here. Was I actually becoming that most horrid of criminals? No, not a drug dealer, which was a matter of bad taste. I, may, I mean, was I becoming a capitalist, which was a bad matter of bad morals, especially as the capitalist, unlike the drug dealer, would never recognize his bad morality, or at least admit to it. A drug dealer was just a petty criminal who targeted individuals, and while he may or may not be ashamed of it, he usually recognized the illegality of his trade. But a capitalist was a legalized criminal who targeted thousands, if not millions, and felt no shame for his plunder. So that's a little you know, sketch of the committed. Uh, there's lots of hijinks around his becoming involved with a with a, a gang and dealing drugs and participating in all kinds of nefarious activities with lots of uh, violence and hope and action to keep you entertained but also some of the spirit of the sympathizer and satire and, and political critique as well hope you like it first question I will ask um, since you just read is, okay, so in both The Committed and The Sympathizer, the, vo the voice is very striking. Um, it's restless and angry and musical and often very funny. Um, and I wonder if you can say more about how this voice came to be for you. Was it, um, I did an event a few months ago with Marilyn Robinson and I'm always struck by the fact that like she says that the narrator of Gilead just started talking in her ear one day, like it just like arrived whole. Um, and how was it for you? Was it was it immediate or was it a longer, did it involve a longer process? Well, you know, with The Sympathizer, I had a, a, a kind of a plot laid out, but I didn't know how the, the novel was going to open. And so it took me a few months to try to figure out the opening scene and the opening line for the novel. And I knew it was going to be told in the first person. Uh, when I hit the opening line of the novel, uh, I'm a spy, a sleeper, a spook, a man of two faces. I thought, this is it. This is going to be his voice in the novel. And that the reason why this was so important was because it would be a voice driven novel. And this voice would be with us in our ear, in my ear and in the reader's ear for the entire time. And so it was absolutely important to catch, capture that voice in terms of the rhythm, the pacing, but also the, the quality of the voice in terms of what the sympathizer was going to say. And uh, I was unprepared for that. You know, I wanted to create a character who 
would allow me to say certain kinds of things that were near and dear to my heart, uh, but which would you know not be so interesting coming from me, but hopefully through him it would be. And so it was the creation of a character who emerged from inside of me, sort of my alter ego, and he has taken on a life of his own. I mean, he says things that I believe in, but he's also doing things that I never um, expected him to do. And so that's a very fortunate thing to be able to um, conjure up a character like this who has uh, a life of his own. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, let's see. I have like seven questions I want to ask after that. But OK, well, I was rereading a powerful essay of yours um, in which you said, I wanted my fiction to be as cre- as critical as it was creative. Um, and I found that fascinating. I feel as though it's an especially American phenomenon, the idea that writing and art could ever be apolitical, as though I'm apolitical weren't like one of the most political things <laughs> anyone could say. Um, and could you say more about this and about your path toward finding for yourself um, this critical and creative mode of writing fiction? Yeah, well, I don't know if you agree with me, but you know, so let me know. But I mean, I've, I've read a lot of contemporary American fiction, and a lot of it does strike me as being apolitical um, for a variety of historical reasons, partly to do with this country being a deeply anti-communist country, and also this country arguably being a little anti-intellectual. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think a lot of readers and reviewers and critics approach fiction wanting it to follow certain kinds of conventions and norms, both in terms of the subject matter, but how the fiction is written, tending towards, I think, you know, sort of middle of the road, middle brow, literary mm-hmm. realism, which I can appreciate. But I'm also really deeply attracted to other kinds of fiction that are, that's more experimental or more avant-garde or more, more philosophical. And I always thought of The Sympathizer as being my attempt to write a great American novel through a European modernist approach. And this is born partly out of the fact that I have an academic background, you know, I have a PhD in English. I've done a lot of reading in American literary history, but also theory. Because I wanted to do it and hopefully to model this for other writers who might be inspired by this as well, but mostly really just to give free reign to this voice that we just talked about that is so uh, deeply within me and uh, just, to, just to feel unrestrained and unrestrained uh, by the conventions of, of American fiction. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I feel as though there is a real, um, there's a real resistance in American letters to there being like ideas in fiction, which is always so wild to me because um, ideas are everywhere and they're there regardless of like whether they're explicit or not, they're there. Um, and, it's a, and it's a statement of its own to, to leave them all implicit. Well, um, you mentioned the anti-intellectual bent in American fiction. Um, you reference, in this book, um, you reference a lot of writers and thinkers, and there's a kind of exuberant proliferation of references. And could you talk about your thinking behind how you um, go about incorporating these other minds into your fiction? You also said that you wanted to say some things that were near and dear to your heart. Um, and was that sometimes hard to like fit it in, you know, to, to, to find organic ways for, for, that to, for that to pop up? Well, you know, it's interesting that in reading some of the reviews, I, 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 you know, I've done, I've done something very different for this novel, which is that I'm just trying not to read reviews, whereas with The Sympathizer, I've read every every review, including everything on Amazon.com and Goodreads, because it was the first novel out. <laughs> this, time, this time I was like, no, I'm not doing this. But a few reviews still snuck past, you know, and I and I think in one or two of them, people have remarked, you know, positively or negatively, uh, or skept- or just, you know, bemusedly upon, mm-hmm. about, about the proliferation of, names of philosophers that are mentioned in this in this book um and again goes back to your point like uh american readers apparently just don't expect to see the names of philosophers and thinkers in fiction and i guess it's true for a lot of people or for many people they don't encounter these names but in my life i do and in the life of people i know i they do And so, again, why is it the convention that we just can't talk about philosophy as if some portion of the American population doesn't read it at all? So I think for me, it is realistic to include philosophy in here because it's true for some readers and it's true for this particular narrator, the sympathizer. I mean, I built up his biography so that he spent time in an American university, Occidental College. He's an intellectual. He's, you know, he 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 was an American studies major during a very revolutionary time in, in American thinking in the 1960s when there was a 
foment around the anti-war movement and Marxism and all of this. So I, I thought it was believable that he could be exposed to these kinds of things. Plus he has a French background at a lycée and the French in my stereotypical thinking love ideas and philosophy. And you know that's one of the jokes in the book that the Vietnamese and the French love philosophy, the Americans don't. I mean, the, the American version of philosophy is the how-to manual, but the French actually read philosophy uh, in high school, right? So this to, me, this to me was fine. And also in this, in this novel, The Committed, again, this novel is to me a novel about what happens to somebody who's a revolutionary who's been disillusioned, disabused of his ideals. So he's deeply traumatized, but he's also taking this time to rethink all of the ideas that have shaped him and motivated him. And this is why he goes back to talking about uh, Franz Fanon, Aimé Césaire, uh, uh, important kind of revolutionary post-colonial thinkers whose ideas have a total bearing on both the life of this uh, the sympathizer, but also the, the milieu that he finds himself in, in early 1980s Paris, where immigrants and people of color, they wouldn't call them this in, in France, but using this American term, people would be thinking, I think, about these kinds of issues at a time when France was struggling with trying to um, confront its colonizing past and also confronting the fact that all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but now it has immigrants who are not white, not European, that it's imported to do labor and everything else. Uh, this is the kind of you know moment of political change that the sympathizer finds himself thrown into. So why not talk about these ideas? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I do find it odd. No, it's so true. When people, when there are like no references to other artists, writers, thinkers, it's like, really? Your character just doesn't, and especially when they, when they are the kind of character who would be thinking about these things. Um, that is so strange about so much of American fiction. Um, let's see. Going back to how funny the voice is and how much humor there is in the book, um, I find I increasingly appreciate and I'm really hungry for novels that meaningfully include comedy, include humor. Um, it's something I've been thinking about with my in progress novel. Like I think I'm kind of a funny person in real life. And <laughs> and like my first novel did have humor in it, but far less than in my life. And I'm interested in playing more with laughter. Um, and were there any challenges particular to incorporating so much comedy? Were there any joys particular to it? You know, no one who knew me before I wrote The Sympathizer would have said, Viet's a funny guy. That was never a reputation of mine and never in anything I've ever written. So tapping into The Sympathizer, his creating his voice, which is also my voice as well, I discovered I do have some streak of comedy uh, within me. And I think it comes out of the fact that I've always been a very polemical person, contrarian person, and that I've enjoyed satire and absurdity in the fiction and the and the com in the and the drama that I've read. So it was, uh, yeah, I never thought I could actually do it, but I tried to do it in the sympathizer, and apparently it worked. Um, and it's, it's sometimes hard to tell where comedy comes from. Sometimes you can plan the comedy. Uh, like there are jokes that I deliberately wanted to put into the committed, for example, a lot of poop jokes. You know, the fact that my personal experience stepping on dog poop in Paris, it still deeply offends me. Paris is a wonderful city, but it's the most disgusting dog poop city in the world, as far as I'm concerned. And that includes, you know, countries that France colonized. You know, the Vietnamese, as I point out, we do not allow dog poop on our streets because we eat the dogs first. <laughs> and if we don't eat the dogs first, we don't let them out of the house to poop in the street because somebody else will eat the dog if the dog is on the street. So that stuff I can plan for. And sometimes, the, you know, comedy just comes out of nowhere. You're just creating, you're typing a storyline. You've set up the, you've set up all the elements, the plot, the character, the voice, and then magically the synergy will produce a joke. And that's a really wonderful moment when you can also surprise yourself with laughter as well. And maybe the last thing I'll say is, you know, I've, I've reread uh, Kathy Park Hong's Minor Feelings, a book I recommend to everybody. There's a chapter in there on uh, Richard Pryor, you know, as sort of a, 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 a a figure of inspiration for Kathy as someone who is deeply political and, and also deeply um, uh, uh, profane and who uses comedy as, as a political mode of, of expression. And I think that's also what I, I hope to try to do in these novels as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, I love Minor Feelings and would recommend it to anyone out there who, who hasn't read it yet. Um, it's a really beautiful book. It's a really powerful book. Um, well, 
I know there, so, so of course, you know, like there have been and are many other um, wonderful Vietnamese American writers, um, but your book, your writing and where it's gone, um, it is a kind of first, not just for Vietnamese writers, it's a first for Asian writers in, in a lot of ways. Um, could you talk about the, the weight and responsibility of being a first? I imagine it's, um, I imagine there's joy, but I imagine there must also be a real burden to it. I don't think I'm the first though. I mean, honestly, like you said, like first and what, you know, I'm not the first Asian American. I'm not the first Vietnamese American. There's literally dozens of Vietnamese American writers who published before me. So it was really great because when I started writing in college, there weren't that many. It was like, you know, I, I wrote a thesis on Vietnamese American literature in college. So I know exactly how many, just like less than 10, uh, five maybe. And, mm -hmm. but by the time I finished writing my short story collection, there was no more need to be the Vietnamese American writer writing the first Vietnamese American short story collection. People beat me to it. That was very liberating. Mm -hmm. So it's good not to be the, there's nothing to, to go around saying, Hey, look at me. I'm the first. And that's yeah. a, that's a really screwed up mindset to have. It goes along with the mindset of the voice for the voices, which I'm always saying, don't do that. Don't say that. Don't try to be that. Don't try to compliment other people on doing that because what we, we really should all be doing is creating the conditions for abolishing voicelessness. We should be helping other people find their voice. We should be drawing attention to the fact that our communities have many loud people who just aren't being heard. We're just being silenced. I mean, that's really what we should be drawing attention to. So if being a first in anything means anything to me, it's to say these things and say, you know, you who have made me the first, you should look at yourself. <laughs> why, 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 what's taking you so long to get the first X, Y, or Z in the door of your organization? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember um, Alex Chi, um, who is Korean, and I'm Korean. Um, I remember he once, I'd published, I'd organized and published um, sort of like a discussion roundtable about like, basically about like how wonderful we all think Alex is with Korean American writers. And I remember Alex said, you know, um, his first reaction was, was just like, he was very moved, but he was also like, I've been waiting for you all. You know, like, this is what I've been waiting for. This is the future I was waiting for. And that, and that like, I just, I cried so much just so that those were. Yeah. No one wants to be lonely, right? No one wants yeah. to be, I mean, oh, but maybe some people want, maybe there are people who want to be the only one. Mm. That's really a screwed up mentality, you know? And of course, some, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the historical, I think about, I wrote a whole dissertation on, on Asian American literature, you know? So yeah. I think about how, you know, Suisse and Far, Onoda Watana, there they were, for writing in 1896 and in 1912 as the first self-identified Japanese and Chinese American writers. And they may, may, or may, may or may not have wanted to be the only ones, but they were by just by definition, the only ones. How lonely must, ha must that have been? You know, so, so Alex is absolutely right that we want the cohort. We want the solidarity. We want the community because that means that there's more people who understand what we're saying, who can read our manuscripts with us and who can have these conversations. Yeah. And we know where we're coming from, that we're drawing from a, a very uh, similar set of concerns and histories. And that with every passing decade, basically, the cohort grows and we, we, we foster more and more writers. So we just look at Asian American literature. I remember when I was writing my dissertation, there would just be like a book a year. You know, and every, we were, you know, I would, everybody would go crazy. Oh my God, there's another book by an Asian American writer. And now there's literally, I think probably one every week or every month at the very least in all the different genres. And that's, that's absolutely amazing. It really is. This year I was noticing that um, there were like two different Korean American books that I hadn't known about before they published. And I was like, oh my Lord, this didn't used to happen. I always knew what Korean books were publishing because there were so few. And so they were, we waited so long for each one. Um, and it's just been incredible seeing, I mean, there, there doesn't begin to be enough Asian American fiction, of course, but it's, it's wonderful to see that it's not quite so small anymore, that the pool's not so small. Um, along those lines, can you, we were talking right before um, the event, we were remembering that the, um, the last event, the last time we were at an event together was when you very kindly agreed to help me with hosting a get out the vote event for the general elections. The time before that, it was because we were asked to help with the fundraiser for the Bay Area Book Festival. Um, you spend a lot of time on community work. And how do you think about this, about being a writer who gives back? How do you balance? And, and I guess I'm also wondering, like, how do you balance your own writing and reading with what you do sort of more for others? You know, I, I, uh, I think I, I blame it all on being a Catholic. You know, like, I, I don't really believe in God and go to church and all that kind of thing, uh, except when I go home and see my dad and, and, uh, and, but, but the, the, the fact of being raised Catholic and with all the guilt and with these themes of, of solidarity and sacrifice and justice and martyrdom, I think that really, you know, put something in, in me, this, this concern for, 
for others and for thinking beyond oneself and end up building a community of one kind or another. And so I just transpose that into a, a more um, uh, secular context of justice for when it comes to community building, whether it's Asian Americans in general or people of color or refugees and migrants or, you know, Vietnamese Americans and so on. So I did that, I was doing that in college, you know, like, you know, showed up at Berkeley and there was no sort of, uh, there was a sort of just beginning of an a Vietnamese American and Asian American undergraduate literary scene, threw myself into that. And that just continued on into the present. And I, I really think it's crucial, obviously, that we do all these things, fundraise, network, organize new organizations, uh, read each other's work and promote new writers and all that. But it is tiring. It is exhausting. Like last night I was, I went to my Excel sheet just to see, okay, who did I promise to blur? What is the timeline? Can I do this? Do I have to like email people and just sorrowfully decline and, and all of that? But I don't know the way around it really. I mean, for those of us who are committed to the idea of solidarity and, and community building, this is part of the uh, the work that we do. And it's, and it's you, I think about the fact that other people did it for me, right? Other people did it for me. Sometimes I know the work that people have done for me. And sometimes I don't know the work that people have done for me. You know, there are selfless people who do this anonymously behind the scenes for letters of recommendation and reviews and reference ref referrals, and referee reports and things like this. So I know that I've been the beneficiary of some of these uh, actions. And so got to pay it forward. Yeah, I remember, and it must be, I remember, um, I think it was before my novel even came out or maybe it was, maybe it was right after my novel came out, but it was around then. I remember you just like, you posted on Twitter or somewhere that you hadn't, I could be making this up, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing from a faint memory. Um, so correct me about, about the details, but um, you said you hadn't like read a book that wasn't for blurbing purposes in like two years. And I was just like, oh my gosh, what must this be doing? Like, what was that, what was that? Um, that's, that's a lot, that's a lot for your entire writing life to be, yeah. to be about blurbs for two years. Uh, it's a sacrifice, you know, because I would like to read books for my own pleasure. I would like to read books that contribute to the research of my new projects and, and all of that. And now it's not, you know, now it's it's not just blurbs, but uh, I'm on the Pulitzer board. So I'm, I'm reading a lot for that, which I'm grateful for because it's exposing me to all kinds of things I would never normally read. Like I never, I never read biography. Now I'm reading biography. Um, but, but yeah, there's always a, I don't know. There's always a tension there between the, the the privacy necessary to be a writer, right? Like we need our own time. We need to to read what we want, and yet if we are public authors in any way, with our sense of obligations and responsibilities to to others, then we have there is that 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 pull in our time. And I honestly, I, I don't. It's an ongoing struggle for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Um, well, people people do appreciate it. <laughs> um, and and yeah um okay well returning to your to your book um the opening register of the committed is on an epic scale the boat is an arc these people are heroes um and i mean they are immigrants are heroes like i've, I've believed that for so long um and you've talked about the importance to you of this epic tone in describing these refugees journey you said from the perspective of the west and people who are not refugees boat people people who flee by the sea are pathetic they're desperate they're frightened and they're just objects of pity I wanted to refute that. Um, I wonder if you can talk more about about inhabiting about inhabiting that point of view and the importance of that. And can you recommend more works that take this vantage point of the heroic refugees? Um, yeah. yeah, I think basically, uh, if, if if we're just talking about refugees and in this case Southeast Asians, whether they're Vietnamese, Cambodians, Laotians, or Hmong, the the my generation, that is the 1.5 generation born elsewhere and raised here. Uh, have to, I think has taken on that work. I don't think I don't think people I don't think authors have necessarily used the term hero, mm -hmm. but in these very empathetic uh, um, novels and short stories and poems and autobiographies that have been written by these 1.5 generation authors, of whom there are many, focused on the experiences of the war, of being refugees, of the resettlement process in the United States, of the difficulties of facing economic and and you know cultural and racial obstacles here you get a sense that the first generation the parents and the grandparents that these authors are writing about are heroic and so i just wanted to make that explicit as possible certainly in the nonfiction, i will say heroes but as you said in the in the opening sequence the choice of vocabulary is very very deliberate um and i refute the language of the boat people as being a 
objectifying and pitying language and deliberately used images of the Ark and of course of the Odyssey and, and what I read, read to you to indicate that the, the real analogy for the experiences of, of refugees who take to the sea, whether it's from this time period of post-Vietnam War or today in terms of refugees fleeing from West or, or North Africa, you know, they're, they, 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 they are embarking on odysseys uh, and they just don't have necessarily the poets to give them that epic quality that Homer gave mm -hmm. to the boat journeys <laughs> of Ulysses and uh, and his men. But I, I think that the, the refugees then and now are, are facing monsters, having adventures, and deserving of these of this kind of recognition. Yeah, and you very rightfully point out that um, that the uh, the pilgrims, like the American pilgrims, like, <laughs> that wasn't an easy journey. There was a lot of hardship. Like, there's not there's there's really nothing different between them and um, and and what are called boat people. Like, they were boat people. The pilgrims were boat people. The original colonizers were all boat people. <laughs> yeah. And as I say in the book, they're lucky that the that the Native Americans or the American Indians didn't have cameras to mm -hmm. take pictures of them because they, they probably looked really disgusting after coming off those boats after several months, you know, mm -hmm. starving and not having been able to take a bath and, and, and all of that. But instead, we, we get these oil color, oil painting renditions of the heroic uh, pilgrims when, yeah, they were probably really in need of a haircut by the time they got to shore. Yeah, and, and also, <laughs> and white Europeans, especially back then, like their hygiene wasn't that great either. Like, it's like they were, they were way dirtier. They're in way worse shape. <laughs> They're the ones who brought the diseases everywhere, man. Um, okay. Well, can you also talk about the place that you mentioned a little bit earlier that, um, that you wanted like a lot of action in your book? Mm -hmm. And something I really enjoy, one of the many things I really enjoy about your fiction is that, um, is that like so much happens, you know? And I feel as though that, that, that that's actually like something that's like noticeable in a in in a um, for lack of a better term in a novel that's considered literary fiction. Like there's so many, and I also I love I love novels where things don't happen too. But I do this I do think it's noticeable. Um, can you talk about the role of action and and what it and what it how it yeah? Can you talk about why it's important to you? Yeah, I, I love novels like you where nothing happens or seems to happen and it's all stream of consciousness and, and so on. I think and I think of writers like W.G. Zabald or, or Thomas Bernhard and so on. But these writers are doing it very, very deliberately. You know, they're making a point out of this. But in in, in a, some kinds of American contemporary literary fiction, I read this, I read it and I'm like, this is kind of plotless, but not in a good way. You know, it's like it's not it's not making a point about our consciousness or about literary form. It's just sort of like not missing dramatic action. And I'm a fan of the so-called genre fic genre liter literatures, you know, like detective fiction, spy stories, because things do happen. I read these books and I'm up till six in the morning trying to finish them because I want to know what happens next. Uh, the only problem sometimes with the so-called genre literature is, is I, 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 I read a series, a famous detective, for example, and then if I put it aside for a year or two years, I cannot remember if I've read these particular books. I mean, I know I've read, read it in general, but I can't remember specific books. So The Sympathizer and the Committed is deliberately aimed to hit that sweet spot between having plot-driven action, which is gonna keep us turning the pages, hopefully, but also these literary aspirations towards certain kinds of gestures towards profundity or ideas or themes or, or symbols and all of that that will help us to help, you know, remember what these novels are about six months or a few years down the road. So both trying to be entertaining, but also trying to give us, give the readers some, some ideas to, to think about for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you published your, and with The Sympathizer, you published it when you were 44, if I read that correctly. Um, and yes, y'all, um, his, that was his first novel and it won a Pulitzer, no big deal. Um, and this book came out five years later after that. Can you talk about can you talk about like your revising process, how you knew each of these books was done or like your, with your work in general? Well, with The Sympathizer, you know, I, I, uh, I had two years off from my teaching and, uh, and no one knew who I was. So no one was around to bother me. And so what I did there was 
I would write a chapter, uh, it would take me like a week or 10 days to write a rough draft of a 20, 22 page chapter. And then the rest of the month, I would just revise, revise, revise that chapter until it was completely polished and then I'd move on to the next. So at the end of two years, I had basically a first draft, but it was a really revised first draft and I didn't have to do that much work on that. And it took me a few more months after that to do another revision of the entire manuscript. It didn't work that way for the committed. So each of my books, has required something different for me. So there's no formula so far for me to follow. But in the committed, uh, my life was very disrupted by the consequences of the of the Pulitzer Prize. We should all be so lucky to be so disrupted, but it did mean that there was a lot of interruptions to my work. And um, I, I, I tried to do the same process of writing a chapter and then revising it deeply before moving on and it didn't work. You know, so I would write it and I would revise it a little bit but then I just needed to move on. I needed to make forward progress on this book because so much time for me was elapsing. I should have finished this book in two or three years, but it took like four years, maybe a little bit more than four years because of all these delays. Just wanted to get to the end of that first draft. And then I revised that first draft after after that. So not quite the same, not quite the same process for this book. Yeah. Um, and you're, and you're of course, um, you're a very serious writer of nonfiction as well as fiction. Um, you're, you're a scholar. And can you talk about those, how those, um, how fiction and nonfiction, the roles they play in your life? Are they, uh, are they on um, equal footing in terms of, I don't know, centrality to your life? I think so. I think, uh, again, if I only read fiction, it would be very fun. But yeah. it, especially if I'm only reading American, <laughs> keep hitting on American literature, but if I was only reading American literature of the contemporary moment, it would be kind of a shallow reading experience. And mm -hmm. that I worry about, you know, I think I really believe both in reading deeply, but reading widely as well, which means widely across genres, widely across languages and nations. And if you're only reading one particular genre at one time in one country, it's a really limiting, limiting experience. So for me, nonfiction, um, because I was steeped in it, and I count scholarly work as nonfiction. I know that in the, the American literary world, when people say nonfiction, they're talking about biographies and memoirs and essays and journalism. And I, I count philosophy and uh, scholarly work, academic work as nonfiction too. I don't know why these distinctions are, are out there. Um, they provide ideas that are really, really crucial uh, for my conception of myself as an author and my conception of what fiction and the literary form can do. So I've learned a lot from the critiques of philosophers and theorists and literary critics about what literature does and the limitations of certain kinds of literary works. So by thinking critically as a literary critic about the things that I've read, I think, well, I really admire what this author has done in this book, but I don't like this thing that that person has done. And so the sympathizer and the committed are, you know, designed with all of these ideas in mind about what I've admired and what I've found to be limited in the literature that I've read. And the, 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 the narrative trick in these two books is that even though they're novels, they're really written as nonfiction because in both cases, in both books, the sympathizer is writing these, these manuscripts as confessions. So if he's writing them as confessions, he does, he's not bound by the mm -hmm. conventions of literary realism. He's not trying mm -hmm. to write a novel. He's just simply trying to get out what he has to say. Uh, and in both cases, his, he's deeply conditioned by the circumstances in which he's writing his confession. So in The Sympathizer, he's in a re-education camp. He's undergone, <laughs> undergone a lot of torture. And as we discover in, uh, in The Committed, uh, he's also writing from a very particular place. Um, I can't remember if this is giving away something or not, so I'm not going to say where he's writing it from. But he's writing from a very particular pace, place that shapes how and what it is that he's writing. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I think you're, I think you're, um, well, let's see. I keep having like five questions I want to, I want to ask every time you say something. <laughs> Do you write with a particular kind of audience in mind or like a person in mind, um, but with, with, with your novels? Well, you know, when I wrote The Refugees, which was the way I taught myself how to write, I was very preoccupied with audience. You know, I, was, I uh, this was, The Refugees was about, was about Vietnamese Americans and Vietnamese refugees. And I thought it was for the Vietnamese American community. Um, and it was also for agents and editors and publishers. Like, you know, I had a preoccupation. Are these stories going to be published? Am I going to get this book published? And so on. And that's kind of a debilitating for me mindset to have, but it was really hard to get rid of it. But when I got to the sympathizer, I got, I got rid of that mentality. And I honestly could say that I wrote it for myself 
which I, I'm, I'm pretty sure my agent would not did not like hearing that if I ever if I ever told my my my, my wonderful agent that, um, because we still have to sell books, you know, we still have to sell books. But from the perspective of writing the, the sympathizer and then for the committed, that that was not my mindset at all. It was very liberating, and I think this is true for a lot of other writers to write just for myself in the sympathizer and not to worry about the audience, to write the book that I wanted to see, I wanted to write. That's also what Toni Morrison's injunction. If you don't see something out there that 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 you want, then you gotta do it yourself. With the committed, there was another obstacle, which is, well, the sympathizer was a success. So now do I have to worry about an audience? Now do I have to worry about pleasing readers? And I thought, no, I can't do that. I, I have to write a novel, this novel as well, with that same ambition that this is for me first and foremost, and hopefully there will be readers who follow along. Uh, if there aren't, then, um, you know, my publisher won't be happy about that, but uh, but I will be <laughs> to a certain extent. Um, so this, I think there's a certain kind of um, belief in my own integrity as a, as a writer that really the art should come first and the audience comes a distant second. Yeah. Sorry, audience who's watching. <laughs> No, that really resonates me with me, um, and I feel so. I also, I when I write, I can't think about an audience. I can only it, it has to be for myself because it's so absorbing that there's no space for anything else. Um, and I've also, it's, it occurred to me at some point that that of course also means that the body I'm centering in my work is like a queer Korean American immigrant woman, um, and this is not a body that has been centered very often in American letters, and so it does have. A lot of implications, um, a lot of political implications, I think. Um, and it's important to me that I keep that in a lot of ways. Um, Let me just respond to that because, you know, queer, Korean, woman, immigrant body, what's the audience for that? If you started worrying about the audience for that, mm -hmm. like, is Twitter the audience? Because if you go on Twitter and you put up those words, you're going to get all kinds of terrible <laughs> responses, including from other Koreans, you know? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and the same thing for being Vietnamese, just because I'm Vietnamese does not mean that Vietnamese people like me. In fact, I'm pretty sure a lot of Vietnamese people don't like me and my work, which is okay. We we don't have to please our family, our mm -hmm. community, our kin. Sometimes we have to go against them. Uh, for various reasons. Um, and so if you are coming from this very specific situation that hasn't been talked about before, there's no audience for that. You create the audience because you're true to yourself and your experience and your vision. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel as though so many um, of the marginalized writers I know, there's an exhausting element of you write your work and you, but you also have to clear space for your work. Like you have to like go out there and like cut down trees to, to make to make a clearing so that your work can have a place to to live and that can be so tiring. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let's see. Um, can you talk about? I saw. Oh, yeah, I see Bernard. Bernard, are you are you on with questions? I am, but please, if uh, if you want to ask that last question, go ahead. Um, well, I was just going to ask about the third book, which is a kind of sequel, or at least in the same family. Can you say anything about it for your for your admirers out there? Oh, the third book of the of the Sympathizer trilogy? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, yes. I mean, I've started to talk about it because in the process of, well, part of the writing process that I have is even as I'm writing a book, I'm thinking about the next book as well. So mm -hmm. even as I was writing the Sympathi uh, the, the Committed, I was emailing myself notes all the time. So I think I've email folders stuffed with notes about plot and character and ideas for the third and final novel. Um, because I think if you read the Committed and you get to the end, I mean, I, it, there's, a, there's an end. But I think there's also an opening. I think, um, yeah, sure. and I was, I was, I was uh, reading Elena Ferrante's Neapolitan Tetralogy, beautiful uh, quartet of books, and uh, very different than mine. But nevertheless, I admired how at the end of each book, I was left desperately wanting for more to, you know, that the story would continue. So hopefully, that's that's the same with the end of the committed for some readers. And yes, uh, I'm so I'm going to give away one element of the novel. Um, he does live, and uh, in the final installment of the Sympathizer Trilogy. I promise there will be no part four. He has to go back to the Americas to make amends and seek revenge. So that's what's gonna happen. Revenge, I love revenge. <laughs> <laughs> what's a world without revenge and crime stories without revenge? Revenge is wonderful. <laughs> revenge stories are wonderful. <laughs> okay, um, I will pass the mic to Bernard. If Hi Bernard. Uh, I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? 
just a few uh just a few of the audience questions and um thanks to the audience for submitting uh here's the first one viet there are many vietnamese spies which ones did you have in mind as you created the captain well, uh, the most famous one that people and people know about about him is Pham Suan An, who was uh, uh, the most successful spy in Vietnamese history, as far as I know. And, and he's a very interesting character because he actually came to study in the United States in Southern California at Orange Coast College in Orange County in uh, the late 50s and uh, absorbed American culture. And, you know, he was probably already at that point being groomed to to be a spy um, and he came back to Vietnam and he became a journalist uh, in the South and worked with a lot of American journalists as their uh, uh, fixer, their go-between who introduced them to, to, to a, lot of, a lot of people. And he's, he was very well regarded by his American colleagues who thought of him as a friend. Um, and they were kind of shocked at, eventually at the revelation that after the war, he was uh, probably the most important spy that the, the North had in the South and that he'd been promoted to a general in secret for the various contributions that he made. And you can find his story recounted in a couple of well-written memoirs that are out there, uh, well-written biographies that are out there right now. Uh, next question, uh, along the lines of your, your, your man of two minds, um, and it's about literary influence in particular, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. Um, and uh, to what extent the Invisible Man influenced the sympathizer's struggles with dualism and identity conflict. And also, um, I I'm curious if you would uh, say something about just first encountering that book. What was the context for that? Is that a high school thing or did you come across it later on? Well, I went to Berkeley for college and um, Berkeley was a very transformative experience for me politically and intellectually. I became an Asian American there, but I also was exposed to uh, black literature. Not for the first time, I'd read The Color Purple in high school, but that was the only, I think, book by, by a black author that I had read before going to college. And then in college, I took um, Barbara Christian, Professor Barbara Christian's Afro-American literature course, and there we read Toni Morrison, Zora Neale Hurston, Richard Wright, all the great writers in the black tradition, including Ralph Ellison. And I wrote a 20-page paper on Invisible Man as an undergraduate, delving into it really deeply. And I was just blown away by that novel, both as a novel, but as a uh, an essay really about the black experience too. And it always stayed with me. And his novel influenced Henry Park, uh, Chang Rae Lee's native speaker in the creation of, of his narrator, Henry Park. And so I've situate the sympathizer in that lineage, you know, uh, not Invisible Man to native speaker to me, but even before Invisible Man, Ellison was undoubtedly influenced by W.E.B. Du Bois's Double Consciousness and the Souls of Black Folk. And Ellison has been very clear about his inheritance from Dostoevsky. So, I, you know, Dostoevsky's also, also, Dostoevsky also runs through my work as well. So the thing about Invisible Man is that I think it's it still remains as a powerful exploration of duality and a condemnation of American racism. Uh, and the plight of, of the so-called minority intellectual who's caught between different kinds of pressures. The ending of Invisible Man, I have to give it away a little bit, though, is something that I, that I have disagreement with. In Invisible Man, our narrator, the Invisible Man, uh, engages deeply with, with revolutionary politics, uh, the Brotherhood, and it becomes a revolutionary and then becomes disabused, disillusioned, and his response to that is to crawl into a hole underground. And then when he emerges at the end of the book, he emerges not as a part of the brotherhood, a part of solidarity, a part of the collective, but as an individual. And that's where the book ends with this gesture towards individualism and hope. And I thought this really resonated with the 1950s in America, this era of an anti-communist liberal approach to race and, and politics and that was not going to be my approach. So I, I signaled, my, signaled my departure from Ellison and this idea of anti-communist liberalism at the end of The Sympathizer, where instead of going towards the liberal individual I, we instead have a reassertion of the collective we at the end of that book, which is also how The Committed begins. Thank you. Um, another one, uh, how did the political climate I assume this person means the um, political climate in the U.S. between the publications of The Sympathizer 
and the committed effect, uh, the writing of the novel, I, I think we should take a step back and say, did it affect and in what ways may it have? Well, I think that the uh, the novels are set in the past, the 1970s and the 1980s. But even when I was writing The Sympathizer, I was affected by the political events of the day. So the last few chapters of The Sympathizer are all about torture. And uh, during the early, early period of writing The Sympathizer, I think you know, Abu Ghraib was happening. Um, and so there's a lot of resonance in my mind between uh, contemporary events and the events of the novel. With The Committed, uh, certainly most of it was written during the period of the, the Trump administration. And it just felt to me that what the Trump administration really represents is not something new in American history, but the resurgence of something old in American history that has always existed from the very beginnings of this country in colonization and white supremacy. Um, never left us, still here with us. And so the, 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 the Committed is a novel about colonization. And this was very, very important to me. I think as a Vietnamese American writing a novel about the Vietnam War in The Sympathizer, I knew I was skirting with an issue that, you know, Reese is very familiar with, which is, oh, it's the Vietnamese guy writing about the Vietnam War, of course. And then people are going to compartmentalize it and say, you know, that's what they do. Whereas in my mind, The Sympathizer was not only about the Vietnam War, The Sympathizer was about American imperialism and about Vietnamese communism, this huge conflict. And I wanted to make sure that in The Committed, people understood this, that people hopefully would read The Committed and, and I and would not, would, could not come, come away from this thinking, this is a Vietnam War novel. No, it's a novel that extends the project of The Sympathizer into anti-colonial critique and into a condemnation of colonial, colonialism, broadly speaking, which is in the, at the foreground French colonialism. But remember, the Americans came into Vietnam in 1950, from 1945 to 1954, Americans had many opportunities to tell the French, you gotta, you gotta stop. Colonization is bad, it's against our ideals. And what did the United States do? It joined completely in the project of French colonization, which is why the Vietnam War is simply an extension of a worldwide colonizing project. And that's what the committed condemns. And to that extent, it is a response to the events of the Trump administration, uh, because I think the Trump administration is simply a, a nostalgic uh, extension of the colonizing project, the settler colonial project of the United States. Last question. Um, the questioner says, I am a Pakistani American and found your quote on the yin and yang of American politics in the sympathizer to be very relevant to the current political climate, uh, especially as it regards recent hate crimes against Asian Americans. To me, the questioner, this is reminiscent of post 9 11 and obviously an ongoing reality for what I would say are Asian minorities, would love to hear more on your thoughts on the reality of the erasure of Asian narratives in that yin and yang metaphor. Sure, yin and yang, uh, as in black and white, as in us or them, as in the basic binaries of politics that are you know widespread, not just in the United States, but of course in the United States, so much of our political thinking is saturated with these binary opposites so that whenever a crisis happens, it's very reflexive for many Americans to resort to an us and them kind of rhetoric. And certainly as the, as the questioner said, we, we, we turned to that rhetoric after 9-11. Um, and it's a rhetoric that, that sometimes benefits us who, who happen to be people of color and sometimes works against us. I remember very distinctly in the immediate post 9-11 moment you know, there were black Americans remarking, you know, self-awarely, self with great self-awareness that, oh, okay, now everybody's worried about Muslims and Arabs. They're, they've taken their eye off the ball when it comes to anti-black racism. That, that kind of reprieve, if you can call it that, didn't last for very long. Um, so, and obviously with the, with the Trump administration, uh, we, we continue to see what we saw, that kind of very... Uh, um, strict kind of binaristic politics in which it was easy to insert Asians and Asian Americans by condemning, by, 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 by characterizing COVID-19 as Kung flu or the China virus, you know, tr the Trump administration and everybody who used those terms were, were, were dredging up this long history of anti-Asian racism and demonization with clearly deliberate purposes, you know, to distract attention away from the, the failures of our own uh, American policies and instead scapegoating a population, characterizing them as, um, as another. And we're still seeing that happening today. Um, 
I think we'll still see it for, for quite a long time. But I don't know. I mean, the anti-Asian racism, I don't know, Reese, you want to jump in on this because I know you've been active on this issue too and, and join me here in talking about it. But it's uh, it's not a surprise, you know, and, and, and you know, I'm surprised by anybody who's, who is surprised. It just means they haven't been att paying attention to how deeply embedded anti-Asian racism has been in the American imagination and American politics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it and it just and it none of and the escalation is not a surprise either. Like everyone knew a year ago, the minute forty five started talking about Chinese flu, we all knew exactly what would happen, and it was and it was and it was heart rending. It is heart rending. Well, that's it, guys. Um, thank you, Viet. Um, it's it's a terrific book, and Reese, I really appreciate the generosity of your. Um, coming on and and interviewing Viet uh, here and um, I hope uh, uh, we get to see you in person uh, before too long and that that goes for all of you in the audience as well thanks for tuning in and um, good night thank thanks you Bernard. so much thanks,